Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Adventures Through the Mind, a podcast that explores topics relevant and related to psychedelic culture, medicine, and research, always with the underlying question of how we can work with and through our psychedelic experiences to become better people, not just for ourselves, but for all those with whom we are nested in relationship, presently and across time, human and non-human alike. This episode is going to feature an interview with Alexander Biner, and we're going to be asking the general question of how can psychedelics and our psychedelic experiences help us make better sense of reality of the world in a context where it seems as though the world is being bombarded with multiple levels of concentric crises. In other words, the meta crisis. Alexander Biner is an author, journalist, and facilitator focused on bringing new ways of seeing and being from the margins of culture into the mainstream. He does this through writing and by creating transformative experiences that invite us to find ways to evolve and thrive in the chaotic times we live in. He is the author of The Bigger Picture, How Psychedelics Can Help Us Make Sense of the World, and writes a popular substack also called The Bigger Picture. Additionally, he is an executive director of Breaking Convention, Europe's longest-running conference on psychedelic medicine and culture. He is one of the founders of Rebel Wisdom, a popular alternative media platform that ran from 2017 to 2022 and explored the cutting edge of systems change and cultural sense-making. Finally, at least for his bio here, he was one of the first people in the world to experience extended state DMT, also called DMTX, an experience that plays an important narrative role in his aforementioned book, The Bigger Picture, and is something we touch on in the later parts of the interview you're going to hear today. All the things we touch on in this interview include how psychedelics can help us make sense of the meta crisis, complexity tolerance, and the overwhelming deluge of information in modern digital life how and why we solve a problem is as important as the what of the solution itself, the, mis- excuse me, the mythological impact of sci-fi narratives on identity and perception, and whether AI will become a new god. Additionally, we speak on extended state DMT, DMTX, uh, and interacting with entities, overlaps in the perceptual impact of phenomena like DMT entities and UAPs, and emotionally managing the potential of our world slowly declining into a nightmare dystopian future. You know, the last comment there makes you feel like this might not be, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, might be kind of a heavy episode, but give it a chance. It's it's not as heavy in the ending as, as that last statement might make it seem. Before we start the interview, a quick technical note is that uh, we're having some audio bandwidth issues. So the audio drops out on Alexander's side a couple of times. For the most part, everything that you would have missed is intelligible immediately upon it coming back into into clarity. And where it was not intelligible, I intentionally asked for clarification or, uh, you know, confirmation of, uh, of what you might have missed there. So if you're also like me and you like to listen to podcasts that like 1.5 1.5 2x time the speed you probably won't even notice but that's a little heads up to prepare your um, pattern recognition uh, wetware in order to sort of pull out the meanings that might otherwise have been lost in the uh, damage cadence of uh, of the conversation that all said of course this podcast is brought to you by listeners like yourself on patreon so a big thanks to my patrons who make a show like this possible, make the larger body of work that I do possible, and presently make the uh, cost of buying the time to write a book possible. So thank you so much, patrons, for your voluntary financial involvement with this body of work that I have been producing over the last few years. People who give significantly, uh, some of which for a long time, are listed on the names, uh, sorry, on the screen here on YouTube or in the description to this episode, wherever you're checking it out. 
And if you find value in the show and you'd like to express uh, your sort of sense of that value through a financial contribution, you can do so through Patreon uh, or you can do so through a one-time donation or by buying some of the merch that is associated to the show, t-shirts, mugs, et cetera, some of my stuff online, books, uh, digital uh, digital copies of lectures, this kind of thing. Um, links to all of that are in the description to this episode, wherever you're checking it out. And I would deeply appreciate you doing so. Um, that's all for the intro. So please enjoy this interview with Alexander Biner on Adventures to the Mine, episode 185. It's nice. It's a nice Thank background, you. man. Thank you. You notice, uh, I think it's I noticed Let's, my book. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it's on this side. I, think I just... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not an accident, also the Alex. LS, yeah, thank you. And then yeah. like, this is the Groff LSD book. I've got so many of these books on my shelf as well. Mm-hmm. So so like they're kind of like little resonance for me. That's great. That's, you can't really see in this zone, but like if you look real closely down at the bottom, you can see all my Star Trek books. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, uh, uh, sweet. It's like, it's like such a nerd. Actually, this is how I've spent oh, much man, of my I've day. Actually, <laughs> Just I could man, I could riff on some not Star Trek, but just loads of sci-fi books. Um, that's mainly what I read is just sci-fi, uh, and now fantasy. Yeah, I got into the dark arts of fantasy from some sci-fi writers who who also write fantasy. My brother and I are both really into sci-fi, and we exchanged books. And I was like, I just heard a fantasy book. He was like, No, no, the dark <laughs> arts. I was like, now, I'm, now I'm sort of like both so yeah you know this is interesting let's let's call this if you're okay let's call this the accidental start of the interview because and totally off off out of left field this question but i've been thinking about this a lot i also love sci-fi i love reading sci-fi books i love watching sci-fi movies and something i've been thinking about recently is on top of that i like drinking powders and like meal replacements and (laughs) supplementation and like all this stuff. It's, you know, it is what it is. Uh, But recently I've been wondering about something, which is, you know, how much the, the sort of the narratives that we engage create a sort of like accidental mythological foundation in our minds. Like they, they accidentally become like the myths that guide how we understand ourselves in the world. And you know, coming through the pandemic where, you know, my house kind of became a little spaceship, right? Hmm. My sort of containment pod. And then, you know, after that, the car accident, it became a containment pod, but also the cave that I like went back to like lick my wounds. And as I was recovering from my head injury, I started to wonder if they sort of are reinforcing each other to leave me feeling more detached from the world, from like the earth beneath my feet, from like, the mud of my existence and just kind of wondering about that and starting to think, well, what if I, what if I just started reading a lot of solar punk, you know, if that's even a thing, if you can get (laughs) solar punk novels these days, what's your thought on that? I love that question. I also just want to check in with you. How how are you doing post-accident? Like how's your, you know, are you fully recovered? Are you, you know, how's it going? Oh, it's, it's come. It's coming along. It. I appreciate the care and the question. Um, and also, I. So much of my life these days is allocated to dealing with that. That the pockets yeah. of interaction that I have that have nothing to do with that, I try yeah. not to bring it in at all. So I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel and appreciate the care and the question, and I'd love to just. You know, kick Beautiful. that down the road yeah, a little yeah. bit. Yeah. I'm. I'm totally up for that. That's cool. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, so the question of, um, so let let me just see if I got the question right. Is it really around like basically what we're what we're in with embedding ourselves in exploring, fi- you know, fictionally the universes we're exploring, like whether that's then kind of having a, a, a wider impact on how we see the world. Yeah, but I and feel like there's a little bit more to it as well. Like, yeah. yeah and ourselves yeah i mean yes definitely i think that's definitely the case and um it's re- what was really interesting to me to think of was like the escapism aspect of sci-fi that you just pointed to because um you know like we were just saying i i mainly read sci-fi i mainly read sci-fi and fantasy you know i read non-fiction books as well but i actually um 
I struggle to uh, to really delve into literary fiction these days, even though actually my my like university degree was in English literature, and that was like um, something I really cared about. And you know, I'm, I uh, recently I've been reading Prophet Song uh, by Paul Lynch, uh, which won the Booker Prize, which is about this is really you know great book about this slow sort of fascist takeover of Ireland and it's kind of disturbingly realistic. It's set in the near future and it's, it's really grim, like it's heavy, you know? And I, I'm currently on a break from it because there's a new Adrian Tchaikovsky, uh, who's one of my favorite writers. Um, he writes sci-fi and there's a new book from one of his series that's just come out. I can't resist. I've got to get in there, you know? And yeah, so is it, you know, that's a real, like for me, the like the different vibe that I'm immersing myself in reading this sort of like realistic post-apocalyptic kind of story compared to the book I'm reading of his, which is pretty dark as well. A lot of the stuff I read is quite dark, but also um, there's possibility, right? And that's think I think that's what I, I land on when I think about this. When I read sci-fi or fantasy, what I'm exploring is possibilities, and I think that's a really important. Um, and actually quite healthy thing to do. So I would like to immerse myself into stories and realms that are full of different possibility from normal life, not necessarily to escape from normal life, but to bring that possibility into my day to day. And and I do think that not just reading sci-fi and fantasy, but also the video games I play and and the TV shows I watch, I think they do lend a new new possibilities to the way I kind of, you know, solve problems in my life or the way I try and make sense of things or understand people. So I think these things are really intertwined. So it's a, you know, they certainly do, especially in experience. You know, um in my uh some of my DMT experiences, um DMT extended state experiences, I actually actively thought this is way too sci-fi. This is like suspiciously sci-fi, what I'm seeing right now. And the, and the sort of response I got from the experience or from the DMT or whatever exactly is going on was, well, that's because that's your frame. And you have to see the world through a frame or multiple frames, right? You can't not have a frame. And in that sense, I would rather have sci-fi than I would like a, a strict ideological frame like libertarianism or you know whatever, any ism. That, that you can think of that narrows things because uh, the alternative is, you know, so much imaginative possibility in sci-fi. Yeah. Hmm. It's interesting to hear you say that because one thing I was struck with is the sort of confrontation with myself um, that came up when you spoke of this and the confrontation being like, well, actually how much of my reading of it is escapism? Like this is something that I've I've actively grappled with in the past. Um, was sort of wanting to immerse myself in these books and in these stories, especially you know during the pandemic, because it just felt so much nicer to be there than in this life. And uh, coming through the out of the car accident, I, I really I dealt with so much sort of compromised self worth and like self esteem because the very literally the very sort of like wetware required to have self-esteem was compromised but as well the sort of functions behaviors competencies that that are intrinsically tied to my self-worth were also compromised so it was like a one-two punch and really finding myself in sci-fi especially but you know a number of different kinds of fictional novels to escape because it felt so much safer to be feeling the success of the, you know, you know, somewhat hero's journey maybe of the characters mm-hmm. than it was to feel how much my sense of being that in my own life was compromised. Um, now, I don't think that's always the case, especially these days. Sometimes I feel like, damn, this is just such a radically good story. I don't want to, I don't want to pull away, you know? Um, mm-hmm. But it, this is something that I, I think about and I'm starting to wonder as much as I love Star Trek and I'm reading a sort of three book series that like follows the ending of Star Trek Voyager for all you nerds out there. Maybe you appreciate this or maybe not. Uh Um, Yeah, I do. (laughs) You know, (laughs) as much as I'm really enjoying it, I'm thinking to myself, like I maybe need to actively engage content like literary fictional content that is more in alignment with how I want to see the world. Star Trek very much like the idealistic sort of vision of the human future is beautiful, but it also becomes its own little world to get 
sort of trapped in because it's so self-enclosed like Marvel, I guess, then it's not like exploring stories that shift my experience of this world. It's like immersing myself in an entirely different world that has its own rules, its own functions, and eventually becomes entirely detached from my life because it's its own sort of freestanding, coherent existence. Um, and that's why I was like, maybe I should read some more solar punk. Maybe that's the kind of like vision I want to be seeing for my future or like the way I want to be engaging my sense of yeah. what reality is. That's really interesting. Uh, this, this is uh, something that I think yeah, you might be, you might appreciate, but I have only, I, I spoke about this with, um, I had a conversation with Sophie Strand and this idea kind of uh, came, came to me. Um, but I think you might, uh, you might be interested in it. So like Star Trek specifically, right? If we're looking at the Star Trek universe and I, I like Star Trek a lot and I've seen up yes, nine and Voyager and next generation. I haven't read the books, but, uh, I, I would be open to that. But, um, it kind of struck me in that conversation that Star Trek is a very, um, there's something fairly disembodied about the technology, for example, in Star Trek, right? Everything is like, like, and in a way it's the way our technology is moving now where it's like computer what's what's uh, this or this and then you have this disembodied voice sort of giving you it's like a bit like alexa right mm -hmm. and you have basically effectively kindles they're all walking around with some kind of tablet and so you know it's quite interesting how um how similar our technology now is to that but i also think even their even their immersion in natural environments for the vast majority yeah. of the time are simulations right they spend Very time true. in simulations yeah. to sort of get reprieve yeah. So what I think is interesting is that, you know, our technology is moving in that direction and we are becoming increasingly disembodied and disconnected from one another in, in real life. And there's this, um, you know, this, the, the researcher, Sherry Turkle, who researches our relationship with technology and she's been at MIT for many years. She refers to it as this, uh, friction free life. That's what tech designers are looking for. It's like, sorry, can you say you that again? Friction, you don't friction want free what? Because there was a yes. bit of a lag there. Friction-free emotional life. Yeah. So so a friction-free emotional life. Um, and her, her argument is that a lot of tech designers were designing for that because they were like, hey, you know, let's make an app where you don't have to bump into someone in a coffee shop because it's too awkward to talk to them. That was literally a, an app that people were working on when she was researching it, right? Wow. Um, and what's... What's interesting about that is obviously that that creates a, a deep sense of alienation through our technology. Now, Star Wars, for example, what's interesting there is that the technology is all very embodied. It's clunky. It's like the ship isn't working. It's like, get in there, pull some wires. There's robots, you know, it's all the machine, all the, um, and the force, of course, is this sort of, sort of psycho-spiritual force that moves through the body and moves through the universe, interpenetrates everything. Um, but I'm particularly interested in the tech. Like It's like you build – a Jedi builds their own lightsaber. You know, That's like a part of it. It's, it's a mechanical process, an embodied mechanical process that people are in. Like no one in Star Trek builds their own phaser as like an initiation process, right? It's like, no, this is the, this is the standard issue thing that you get and it's all clean and it's all safe. So I just think it's interesting that we have these two different approaches to technology in the culture. We have the Star Wars, we have the Star Trek, they're almost kind of polars, they're, they're kind of different poles of the way we experience technology now. Okay, let's do like a beep, like strange yeah. <laughs> like sort of like spontaneous left turn it's not really because it's now we're getting into what's what's planned as, as juicy as i as i find that but maybe let's not 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 lose that thread entirely maybe it weaves back in so last time you were here on the show uh you were um you were still producing content with rebel wisdom um and you had still yet to be uh, a part of the extended state dmt trials and you had still yet to release your book, The Bigger Picture, which people can see behind me on my shelf and see behind you on your shelf. They're watching Thank on you. video. <laughs> um, and I want to lean in the book being predominantly sort of what inspired us to have another call. And one of the things that you say in the book is in the introduction, the title being something to like how psychedelics can help us make sense of the world or something to this effect. Can you, what's the subtitle of the book again? Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, the big okay. it's the subtitle of the book is exactly what you just said. So, yeah, how psychedelics can help us make sense of the world. Great. So, in the introduction, you say something to the effect of how can psychedelics help us find solutions to the existential crises we're facing as a species. Now, 
since then, oh, and in the book, you sort of present this idea that there are these multiple crises that are kind of happening and moving towards crescendo, perhaps. I mean, this might be out my inference, you know, simultaneously, and that all of these things happening simultaneously represents its own sort of crisis, which you call the meta crisis. Since you wrote this book, I think it's fair to say that things have not necessarily gotten better. Um, in the sect that like these crises haven't all of a sudden starting to get resolved. It seems like they're ramping up. I mean, since then we are seeing the increasing collapse of many institutions, including journalism, healthcare, democracy itself. And we have growing food insecurity, housing insecurity, economic and trade instability, ongoing wars between countries, new wars between countries and sort of uh, invasions and altogether even kind of on the verge, at least my sense of it is, you know, pending to escalate into full global conflict. Given that, do you still feel like psychedelics might help us find solutions? And yeah, well, we'll start there and then I may have a follow-up. So do you feel like psychedelics still might help us find solutions to all of this? Yeah, I, the short and heavily caveated answer is yes. But I think what's what's interesting is, or what's important, is the idea of what a solution exactly is, right? Because I think the problems we're facing are problems of how we are. They're problems of being as much as they are problems of, of coordination and practical solutions. It's, it's all of those things. It's not just one or the other. I, I'm, I don't subscribe to the idea that if enough people sort of, quote unquote, wake up, then there'll be this shift in consciousness. You know, there's all these ideas out there in, in spiritual and, and systems change worlds of like, oh, if we hit a tipping point of like 10% of people wake up, then that'll cascade. I just think it's a fantasy. But also, what does wake up mean exactly? It's just like so simplistic. However, obviously, having experiences that connect to ourselves and to a sense of um, yeah, connect us to other people and to a sense that the world is alive and vibrant and important and, and, and imbue a sense of wonder and mystery. That I think is absolutely essential as a piece of solving the crises we're facing. It's not going to do the thing itself. And one of the arguments I make in the book is that ultimately, you know, psychedelics can open the door of perception, the doors of perception. We have to step through, right? We have to make that decision to step through. And that also involves really actually eventually i think taking psychedelically inspired ways of being and embedding them into our institutions into our relationships into our organizations and that work requires all the same things that any political or social change anywhere requires which is like hard boring <laughs> dedicated work by lots of different people and if you look at like how social you know you look at like any kind of social change movement it's involved a lot of really dedicated people doing that gritty boring two steps forward one step back work and there's absolutely no way we can avoid that you know and so my uh, um, argument is that one of the things psychedelics do is that they they give us a lived experience of how to navigate complexity in ourselves and in the world right things that didn't seem to be connected are revealed to be completely interconnected and interpenetrating and informing each other all the time like your history and your relationships is connected to the place you're in, is connected to your country, is connected to your hopes and dreams, and it's connected to the cosmos. Everything is interconnected. So having that lived experience, we can then apply that understanding to solving problems rather than necessarily that psychedelics, you know, to use McKenna's phrase of um, you go into the psychedelic experience and you, you know, you're like a fisherman and you cast your net and you come back with medium-sized ideas. I think, yeah, great. That's great. It's, we do need medium sized ideas, but ultimately I think the real promise is in, um, what is a psychedelic way of approaching these problems, you know? And that's what I'm really interested in. And I don't have the full answer to exactly what that is, but there's a, there's a few aspects of the state, the psychedelic state that I think can be, the word is exapted so that it can be taken from one state and applied to another. And those include uh, cognitive flexibility, so being able to think flexibly, um, a sense of wonder, uh, also like playfulness and subversion, because those are also aspects of the psychedelic experience, um, and and a bunch more. But all, if I had to 
boil them all down, I would say it's this fluid, flexible approach to being in the world and to, to navigating complexity. I think that's the, that's, uh, the great promise of them, I think right now. Hmm. And so I want to, I want to hold, I got this from somebody I know, like, uh, using my crossing my fingers as a way of reminding myself to come back to <laughs> something. So I want to come back to what you said there about psychedelically, like wondering about almost the process mm-hmm. level of these things and how they can be translated out of the psychedelic experience and, and into like the way that we live. But first I want to ask you, this all sounds, you know, great on in theory in the sort of larger scope of things and how our individual experiences might translate out into sort of that larger work of, of, of transformation of our culture, of our society, such that we don't boil ourselves. Um, Mm -hmm. but I'm now I want to sort of ask you the question personally, you know, you've journeyed with psychedelics, obviously, (laughs) at least that I believe that is obvious. Uh, (laughs) And also quite explicitly, you know, you are part of the, yeah, you're a part of the extended state DMT experience, which informed quite a lot of your, uh, you know, was a, it was a big sort of narrative part of, of the bigger picture. My question now is yeah. okay. I'm trying to, I'm trying to find myself in this question because it feels really big, mm-hmm. which is that there are a lot of things that the royal we, we could possibly do. There are relatively incredibly tiny amounts of things that I can do, right? This is me speaking for myself now, such that in face of all of these things, there's a, there's a real sense of struggle for challenge. I'm, I'm wondering now, you know, as you speak about how psychedelics can help us, you know, sort of find solutions to these these larger issues that are contributing to the meta crisis and maybe the meta crisis itself. How have you have how have they helped you find solutions to this within the domain of of action that's actually available to you? Yeah, yeah, that's such an important question, and you know. And I think just just to kind of drill into this idea of what I call spheres of agency, but you know, domain of action is exactly the same thing. It's like, what can I actually do? Like, especially in response to geopolitical events, where my my uh, my level of agency is minuscule, so minuscule as to be sort of inconsequential. Um, but that doesn't mean, it, it, but it depends where we're drawing the lines, right? Because my area of impact in my own relationships is obviously much higher, right? And then, you know, as we extend outwards and start looking at, okay, what's my, what's my area of impact, say in the section of London I live in, you know, what impact could I have there? And of course, online, that question becomes a little bit more interesting and hazy in some sense. It's like, you know, okay, if I, you know, but if I write an article and people read it, like, what is the level of impact that my way of thinking might have on their way of thinking, you know, and vice versa. So, so that question, I just want to kind of just name in a way, but I think just just to answer your actual question is how has it helped me? I think what the psychedelics have always done for me is help me to contain more, to contain more of myself and to contain more of the world in myself. So, you know, I like this idea of like complexity tolerance where it's a little bit like, um, comes from Dan Siegel, psychiatrist idea of the window of tolerance, which is kind of using the trauma world where it's like, okay, we've each got a window of what we can tolerate. Uh, and once we get past that, we'll either go into hyper arousal. So like fight or flight, like, you know, I'm going to fight this thing to make it go away and feel safe again. Or we go into hypo arousal, which is kind of shut down, depressed. I can't move. Um, and I think that shows up politically and socially a lot where we, there's just so much complexity that we're faced with. We're not living on mountainsides herding sheep and have deep rituals that sort of bind us to the community. And we're able to, uh, sure, people in the past had to deal with a lot of stuff in their life. People passed away, relationships ended, all that kind of you know, the same things we're dealing with. But we're dealing with that 
turned up to 11 million, right? That's just undeniable. The amount of information we're exposed to, everything we have to deal with, this strange psychedelic realm of the internet where we're now spending so much of our time, this kind of realm of symbols and, and implicit meaning and wild, chaotic sort of eruptions of psychic energy. We Ooh, are and, and manipulative actors with whom, like, because of that, it's like insidiously uncertain around the reliability of any particular thing that you're encountering. Exactly that, I, I, yeah. And so this very noir—I like to call it like a like film noir kind of reality. You know, in a film noir, you have this like detective who's going through the the, the kind of underworld trying to solve a crime, usually to find a, like find a dame. Like you know, he gets a kind of like. A, you know, there's a missing woman. And so, um, a, a, in a film noir, like everything is revealed as sort of corrupt. Like the judge is corrupt. The priest is corrupt. Everyone's in on it. Right. And so there's this sense, and I think that's late stage capitalism combined with social media creates that sort of like, holy shit, everything is just gross in a lot of ways. So we are dealing with this really un level of weirdness, as Eric Davis would call it, and intensity and complexity all at the same time. So one thing psychedelics have helped me to do, and I'm by no means <laughs> like a master of this, but it's just helped me in some way, is to navigate and, and move with that f more fluidly. Because in a psychedelic experience, there's just a shitload going on. And it's like intensity, and you might be having three or four thoughts at the same time, and dealing with really deep kind of naughty emotionals, uh, emotional topics that are coming up. And it's got a kind of language to it, the psychedelic experience, which is one of interconnected, swirling, um, uh, kind of uh, symbolic meaning and much more, right? It's, it's all of the things. It's also embodied. You're feeling it in your body. It's all going on at the same time. So the more that I've had those experiences and come through them, successfully or uh sometimes with a bit of damage but, <laughs> but you know inevitable. relatively <laughs> yeah. unscathed yeah inevitable uh, relatively unscathed i'm like okay well this is a skill this is a skill that we all learn if we if, if we take our psychedelics responsibly and with with mind and i think that's the skill that's one of the skills that we can that i certainly have been able to take to like okay culture is crazy but how do i delve into it and try and get a get a sense of what's going on Hmm. I I recently read your um your uh, Substack release. I'm not sure what they're called. Articles, blogs um, about prayer. And I'm not asking about prayer here, but you did bring up the winter of tolerance, complexity tolerance in that particular article. Excellent article, by the way, Alexander. Thank you. Um, and the what it brought up for me is something I've been thinking about recently, which is uh, what I say, what I call like, and I assume other people have called this uncertainty tolerance like the ability to be uncertain about a thing and just be there and not have to sort of like be sent into either side of the window of tolerance where you know hypo hypo arousal would be like just giving up not you know mm -hmm. f whatever or the hyper being like no actually i know this double down like yeah. certainty um and sort of like what the this sort of capacity to be like, there are things that I know and there are things that I don't know. And there are things that I don't know I don't know. And there are things that I know that I don't know whether or not I know them well or what I know is real. And yet there are also things that I know that are actually what's happening and functional and pragmatic. But I entirely don't know if those are true either. So it's like this ability to recognize all of that simultaneously and act coherently. Do you feel like that connects with uh, this complexity tolerance you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. And I would say the difference is uh, they're very similar. So uh, for me, when I think of uncertainty tolerance, which I think is also essential for us all to develop because it's just like necessary, I think of a simpler feeling of just sitting with the discomfort very often of that uncertainty. Complexity tolerance, I almost see as more active where it's like there's so many different things to think about and consider at the same time that it's a different kind of overwhelm. Um, but on the uncertainty tolerance, like it is, I think one of the reasons it's so uncomfortable is culturally conditioned because the promise of the enlightenment that we are, which is deeply embedded in all of our kind of sort of like um, cognitive 
uh, machinery in the West is we're going to figure it all out. And the only reason we can't figure out how nature works is because we're not trying hard enough. So we're just going to keep observing and unpacking and all the mystery, like the promise is like all the scary mystery of the world is going to be revealed by the sort of humanistic scientist, uh, sign, well, I was gonna say scientism, but let's say scientific approach. Um, not that I think there's anything wrong with the scientific method. Um, but uh, I'm talking about when it becomes a worldview. So we're going to take a worldview that is going to basically strip the mystery out of the world. Uh, because the mystery is scary and being uncertain about things is, is a scary place to be because then we leave ourselves open to the superstition of religion, which is basically one of the many things that the Enlightenment was pushing against. And so we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater, I think, because it, to be a human being is to be uncertain. And we like that that is and the argument I make in that that article is that prayer is a practice that helps us to identify the limits of our own agency, like where we can act. And it's so important because actually <laughs> There's a lot of limits to our agency all the time. Um, and just as a, as, a, as a side note to that, which I think is really interesting and that I mentioned in the book, there's um, a writer called, a philosopher called C.T. Ingwen. Uh, a lot of times pronounced in my audio book because it's, uh, <laughs> it's a name I'm not familiar with, but he's a really brilliant philosopher. And he has um, a book called, I think it's called Games as art, but basically it's about the philosophy of games, games, you know, video games or any kind of game. And he talks about how games are our way also of playing with agency. So, you know, paintings are a way of playing with visual art. Um, music is our way of playing with sound and games allow us to try out different types of agency so that we don't feel the pressure of our own. For example, it's like, okay, all of our lives just have so many different demands on who we need to be and decisions we need to make, how we're going to show up, you know, what, what choices we're going to, you know, make every single day. Whereas you can play Mario and then you only have one choice. You're, you're just a kind of tubby Italian plumber and your mission is just to save that princess. That's all you need to worry about. Um, you know, and he, he points out how like games also, they mean something like he, he points to this game, um, which is a kind of board game where you're building a train. Uh, you're spending a long a train playing this board game, and then it's revealed in one of the cards, like you're actually building trains to Auschwitz, you know, and it's World War II. And like, do you want to win the game? Like, do you want to keep playing the game with each other and win? Or do you want to stop playing the game? And if you're going to stop playing the game, why, you know, why are you going to stop playing the game? Because it's just a game, isn't it? You know, so then it brings up all these interesting questions. Like, you know, and it goes back to this point about psychedelics that what we're doing in one domain, like say playing a game, does impact to, to some degree our morality, our values, our choices in other areas. Now, we do understand that life is not a game as well. You know, so like, you know, for example, the, the video game panics of the 80s were like, you know, kids are going to play violent games and then that, they're going to be violent. And that's, of course, not true. So, but it's more the sense that serious play right? This this idea of serious play. And that's a, that's a way we kind of exercise or explore our agency. But yeah, prayer is where we go, Hey, I, I can't do anything about this. I'm just going to pray because to a higher power in some sense, right? Um, that requires having some kind of metaphysical system, which allows for a higher power, which I think personally we need. Um, and I think is true, uh, in my view. And I think, um, not having some sense of, there's anything above human beings is part of the pathology of the West right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I completely agree about the pathology of the West having this sort of like a, all of existence is sort of defined upon a hierarchy. The hierarchy is the problem. The problem is that we have positioned ourselves on top of this hierarchy and the value of life, um, the value of all life sits beneath the value, A, the value of human life, and B, the values that humans determine, like the value of that life as determined by human values that I, yeah, I definitely see as part of the pathology of the West. I hadn't used that phrase, but uh, I like that. So I got another fingers crossed. We're going to come back to it, I think, <laughs> with respect to games. We'll see. Either that I'll forget it completely and something else will come up. Um, so it's clear reading your book, reading your Substack, talking with you, you've got a lot of concepts available. You've gone deep into a lot of different things and you have these things available that allow you to 
make sense of certain things. I'm not sure where I heard the phrase recently or even what the phrase was, but it said something to the effect of like, you can't meaningfully interact with a thing that you don't have any language around. I don't think that applies if you consider psychedelics, but um, if we think about that, it's like, it's amorphous and uncertain and, you know, like almost disabling until you know how to say, use a tool. Like a knife can cut you until you know how to use it. And until you have a knife, you can't cut through that branch or whatever it might be. And language in a way can do this. Concepts can do this. When it comes to the solutions or the possibilities that psychedelics can offer us to face crises, I think about this because I believe it was, I, I know it was young that I think it is, and I'm pretty sure he actually said something to the effect of, we need certain concepts available to us in order to have integrative encounters with the numinous. You've had these incredibly positive encounters with psychedelic. Well, I imagine some of them were quite negative <laughs> acutely mm -hmm. and perhaps for mm -hmm. some time afterwards and maybe even still, but you seem to have developed this capacity to make positive action or positive perspective out of your psychedelic experiences. And I find it difficult to sort of disentangle that with the repertoire of concepts you have available to sense make. So I'm, I'm wondering, can psychedelics still offer us these possibilities you're sharing with us here if we don't have those concepts? And alternatively, double question, both difficult, can those concepts, I mean, not the concepts themselves, but what they describe, can they help us discover solutions without psychedelics? Yeah, really interesting question. I would say yes to both of those things, right? So ba basically, um, I love this example actually Ken Wilbur gives where he, you know, he, he distinguishes, he's a, if anyone doesn't know, philosopher and kind of famous for integral studies, but he uses this example of, um, the difference between like waking up, growing up, showing up, all these different aspects of like spiritual awakening or, or just being in the world. And, you know, if you imagine a Zen, there's a Zen monk walking through a forest in like the, the 1400s and they have a Sartori awakening. They're walking through this beautiful forest in this, you know, and they suddenly, they connect with the, the inherent unity of all things and they have this awakening. They have an awakening. They still don't know that the earth revolves around the sun. Right, they still don't have that information. So they have their awakening, their waking up experience, but they don't have that sort of growing up understanding of how the world works to know that. Just because they don't have that information, it's not perhaps available to them at that time. So these things are sort of distinct and interrelated. Like what it means to have a, an awakening experience when you do understand that the earth revolves around the sun is a different type of experience. And so in that sense, I think we do need to have. Um, you know, we go into every trip with all of our framework, all of our cultural background, all of the things we've read and watched and spoken to people about, all of it's in there. And it's all changing the trip and the trip is changing it. So I think it's like a, a reciprocal relationship, right? And I think it's almost impossible to unpack. You know, I in an ayahuasca journey years ago, I asked like, I was like, where, you know, I always have this sort of dialogue. You know, some people have this, other people experience trips in different ways. I always have this sort of dialogue with, uh, I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's me, maybe it's my higher self, maybe it's the ayahuasca, whatever. We don't, I, I really couldn't say. <laughs> Uncertain. But I asked like, I'm like, where, I was asking, you know, the ayahuasca, so to speak, I was like, where are you when I'm not here? Like, where are you? And it was like, that question makes no sense because this exists only in synergy. This is a kind of, as all things do, actually, probably, we know from quantum physics, <laughs> it's just a kind of relational universe. Everything is impact. Everything arises from everything relating with everything else. But I, that really stuck with me because I was like, it's so difficult for us from our um, atomized sort of uh, enlightenment mindset to see things as mutually arising as perhaps a Taoist might, to be like, no, no, flowers and bees are two aspects of the same thing. You don't get flowers without bees. So how could you say a flower and a bee are separate objects, right? They're interpenetrating, interrelating objects. 
it's so I find it. I'm so into Taoism and I've had all these interesting experiences where I've l- had literally had these lived experiences of that. And I still find it really difficult to see the world like that <laughs> still, but partly because of the language that I speak, you know, English and, and, uh, German are, um, basically noun focused languages. It's like who did what, when, why, right? So we want to see what the, what's the object, the, the object is central. And so it's just very difficult to unpack that. But so to, to, to kind of get back in the, yeah, we're not, I think, going to find new ways of being and seeing, um, that significantly lead us to say new policies, new approaches, new ideas without doing the hard work of actually knowing our shit about a particular area, right? Let's say, uh, you know, I had, a someone on a retreat who was in, um, environmental sciences and had this whole experience, um, in her psilocybin retreat of like how to regenerate a wetlands near her where she lived, you know, super specific and awesome, but she actually started doing it, you know, but that never would have happened if she didn't know about environmental science, right? It's not like, you know, well, like, I, I don't want to say never, you know, people do have wild experience. Some people, you know, maybe someone learns the piano for impromptu and I don't want to shut down that possibility. But generally I would say she was able to have that insight and that experience because she was attuned to that knowledge system. And then the psychedelic experience allowed her to, to come to a new understanding of that. So I think what's very promising is the people are doing and that I'm to, to do, you know, this year, uh, and beyond of actually going, okay, how do we create protocols that are say good for solving complex problems or good for, you know, for example, the work Leo Roseman and Sami Awad have been doing, uh, with Israelis and Palestinians drinking ayahuasca together for conflict resolution. That's a fascinating study. Like that's very, it's about narrowing it down and getting specific, um, with the experience and not being afraid to do that because that will, um, you know, well, we have nothing to lose. Let's say that. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Fingers are crossed. I think I've, I think we've made it back. Um, we'll see how it ties in if I can manage it. You know, you said something earlier about psychedelically to learn how to like sort of incorporate a psychedelic way of thinking or sort of a, I, I, I'd use the term process level of the psychedelic experience translated into sort of how we show up to things in the world. And you also spoke about, you know, games and sort of this opportunity to uh, sort of take the pressure off, uh, you know, the 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 expectations of agency in a, you know, nearly or perhaps actually infinite number of variables for action and confine them down to very specific parameters and contingencies and just lean into that and explore that and learn yourself through that. When you said that, I brought that back to thinking about sci-fi and so reading sci-fi, you know, this incredible inspiration or this opportunity for escape. And the question there is like, well, it depends on how we're reading these books, like in the sense of like, how am I showing up to what this story means in my life? Hmm. And, um, I thought of, you know, certain video games, positive, great, really explorational, but depending on the sort of game mechanics, how are we being called to play the game and what effect does that actually have on our life? Because there's a big difference between a story-driven game that leaves you inspired by the dynamics of the characters and a game that like incites you or like uh, pushes you to play more. Games that like reward the grind. Um, So now that all said, one of the things you mentioned in your book is that we need to... I got it written down here. Um, uh, so I, I'll just read exactly what I've written down. So get yeah, confused yeah. trying to bring them together. One of the things you mentioned in the book is that the way we need to address these crises um, is not just in what we do, but how we do it. Okay. So why do you feel that attention to the how is so important? Yeah, I think in a way it's everything, which I know is a huge statement, but I'll try and unpack why I think that. So there is, you know, uh, so there's different kinds of knowing, right? And there's knowing how, knowing that the sky is blue 
is not the same as knowing how to ride a bike or knowing what it's like to be in love or what it's like to just be surfing and totally in flow with the waves and feeling the sun in your face. Like those are different types of knowing. Um, this is something uh, John Verveke, the cognitive scientist, uh, talks about. He has these four different ways of knowing. Um, and so knowing that is not so particularly useful for solving collective problems because we don't, and this is again Verveke's point, we don't necessarily agree on which facts are relevant. So if you look at the culture wars and some an argument around something like COVID, people are like, yeah, but look at these stats or look at these and the stats don't really matter because people don't agree on what information is relevant. They're like, yeah, but that doesn't matter because that's not trustworthy information because that comes from the government or vice versa, right? So we, if, if it was simply a question that we just needed to figure out better facts, then we probably would have solved a lot of our problems already. We're in, we are in a post-truth world in many ways where the issue isn't, with this information overload, the issue isn't that we, we have a lack of knowing what to do. It is, it is much more, how are we going to do it? How are we going to show up? What kind of people are we going to be? Because ultimately, you know, one of the things that really shifts cultures to move in a new direction is the deep beliefs about what is, what is valuable, what is relevant, what is important. Often, I think that comes through re new religions forming, right? These radically new value systems come online and they completely change everything. And it's not to say that every religion in the same way, but a powerful idea will absolutely spread. Um, and the religion isn't necessarily, sometimes religions very often will have like behavioral aspects of it. You should do this thing. That's more of a want. But often it's like, you are this thing. <laughs> That's much more the message of saying that like, you are this. You are this. This is what life is all about. And that I think is the level at which we now need to have a, a shift. Now, it's totally different to in the past because I don't think a single uh, religious movement arising is going to do that. Although, you know, never say never. I'm also pr pretty convinced we're going to see an AI religion forming um, or multiple AI religions forming, and that'll be, uh, add a little extra weirdness to the world. Um, a lot of extra weirdness, but I think what's wrong with us is that we're not able to partly what's wrong. Uh, there's so many things wrong <laughs> yeah. from my understanding. One of the many things wrong is, is we have this inability on the cultural level, at least, which is basically where more, where I specialize more. I'm not on like a, you know, expert systems theorist or, you know, understanding all, all of the ins and outs of that. But what I do focus a lot on is how does culture change? And uh, culturally we are in this kind of tower of Babel situation where no one agrees on anything. And there's just isolation, polarization, and, you know, particularly in the States, you know, reaching sort of properly dangerous levels of um, alienating and othering anyone who disagrees with us, right? It's also happening in Europe and, and, and elsewhere. But so with that's the problem, a bunch of new facts aren't going to do anything. What we need is, you know, for example, to be able to drop into a deeper level of humanity where there's a higher order than just me being right politically or, you know, this is, if I don't vote for this, the, the world is going to end. Um, and so that is much more of an embodied felt sense of what it is like to be alive. What matters? What is it to be human? And those are all qualitative things. They're not quantitative. So that's where I, that's where I, uh, why I think the how is so important. Hmm. What about the, so I'm having a hard time linking. Um, this could just be the inevitable lapse in attention or coherence that is managing the technical <laughs> end of the podcast. Um, but I'm curious how that, where that links in with the, the how, and maybe like there's it almost like what I heard you describe was more in respect to the why, um, like why I would do a particular thing, why mm -hmm. I would do a what is because I believe myself to be this. I believe the world to be that. I believe that these things are more reliable than those things. This is the sort of why. I'm thinking about it in the how. And so using COVID as an example, I, and please everyone listening, take this as the third and shit fourth hand information that it really is, is I was having a conversation with a friend of mine. 
they were telling me about, they've been kind of following, you know, what's happening with the COVID discussion now, the vaccine discussion and all that. And I said to him, like, I'm glad you're doing that. I'm glad others are doing that. That's not what I'm doing right now. I will check in periodically and see <laughs> what's new, you know. But one of the things they said, they were listening to the Sam Harris podcast, podcast I don't generally listen to these days. But what he gave back to me was interesting, something to the effect of there are certain things that the anti-vaxxing people, I want to be conscientious of not pigeonholing people or creating a straw man here, but there was what we called mm. anti-vaxxers who had a perspective that, you know, Pfizer could not be trusted, that this process could not be trusted, that it's there's profiteering or there's whatever it is. And that, so they decided, you know, like, I will not get this vaccine for this reason or that reason. And the way Sam Harris apparently looked at it was, okay, now fast forward a few years, a lot of the sort of conclusions that they came to aren't necessarily wrong. Some of them turned out to be right in a lot of ways, the efficacy of the vaccine, the trust, you know, the trustworthiness of Pfizer and all the rest. Mm -hmm. And so they might've found out in a couple of years later that they were right, but still in hindsight, they were wrong in their actions because the how they were going about it was they might have turned out accidentally to be right but at the time the information that was available it was ultimately a guess and the consequence of that guess was basically a lot of like i don't give a shit about anybody else you mm -hmm. know to this effect i won't wear a mask i don't care i don't believe it blah 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 it still came out as a very uncivic thing to be doing in high and you know fast forward a couple of years um they might not have been wrong in a lot of things, but the way they went about it on the how level was uh, wrong is complicated here, you know, because it's not about a what, it's about the how. Mm -hmm. So this yeah. is why, this is my question. I'm not making any claims about that. It's an example. Is yeah. Yeah. there's why we do a thing and then there's what we do and then there's how we do it. And one of the things that I think I got from your book is that how we do those things matter which is like, for example, do another extreme example. We could end the problems with climate change right now by going out and rounding up every extreme climate, like ecocidal actor and publicly executing them. Mm. Right? Mm. That could solve our climate change problem. But the how in this respect. You, do you see what I'm saying? Like the, the yeah, how there is wrong. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah but so, so I think, I think you're right in the sense that I, I, um, was veering more into the why territory, particularly at the end, but it, it does link to the how in the sense that how basically how we deal with the problem is going to define who we are. Right. Which is obviously is then also linked to the why, but the, the how also then, has consequences of what's going to happen next, right? What we do, so it seems like, you know, let's take that example, right? Let's execute all the bad climate actors. What that does, the how then creates a what, which is a precedent is set, for example. You know, a lot of things come out of that. And then it means that this is how we now do things. We solve problems by executing the problem right and of course we know from authoritarian regimes that that's going to create a whole bunch of other problems but i think that there's like this other element of it as well which is that the 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 how let's take the COVID example right so how we i kind of you know i'm not a huge fan of sam harris but i kind of uh, i think that's you know the argument that uh, as you laid it out i can kind of you know understand uh, that the the how matters because in a sense w with that example the conversation around covid was and is in a sense a lot less now impossible to have because of how people were having it which is absolutely certain of their position on both sides and not able to come into a human level where we're actually talking as feeling human beings instead we're talking as enemies who are potentially going to um be, be the cause of our death or downfall right that that way of doing things right that how doesn't work it just doesn't work there's just nowhere to go because everyone just has to get progressively more polarized 
and get louder. And that's just kind of, it's war. It's basically narrative warfare. So for that reason, right, that's where, you know, and this is in a point I make in the book about the kind of the different practices like inquiry, like, in, you know, embodied inquiry, understanding that the political is personal at a really deep level and, and also perhaps even um, biological, you know, that, that our temperament, our temperament will impact politics. Um, that, you know, if we think about that, it's like, okay, listen, the what like the position you've landed on with a particular issue isn't as important as how we communicate about that issue because how we communicate about the issue is going to be the, what determines whether we solve it. In fact, we want that diversity of opinion because without that, that you know, what kind of society is that? We want to have lots of different voices, but you don't actually get the benefits of diversity if you don't actually know how to talk to people in the first place. If we can't talk to each other, we're at each other's throats. So I think that's probably where the how is, is sort of at its most important is how to have the conversation. Yeah, I think I think I appreciate that you clarifying that there because I feel like what you just shared was much more in alignment with what I was asking about. Although your initial response, they're very complimentary, so um, accidentally on purpose, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> okay, kind of like at the beginning of the interview where it be- spontaneously became the interview before the interview actually began. We're going to take a sort of like you know like a quick write. Um, and hopefully we don't lose too much out of our shopping bags on the way uh, <laughs> with the velocity of the turn. <laughs> so speaking of your, you know, working, your sort of work is predominantly focused on <clears throat> the cultural end of things. Um, mm-hmm. there are certain things that are happening, um, that feel like they have the, they already are, but have inc- an incredible sort of potential impact on culture cultures and intercultural relations. Mm -hmm. And it seems like you kind of like really have your finger on the pulse of that right now on a number of things. So I want to maybe just ask you about a couple of things that I'm seeing coming up in the world and get your perspective on it. The first of which is Mm -hmm. when you were writing the bigger picture, AI was not nearly as substantial feeling at least my assumption, as it is now. You had an excellent chapter on the internet, presented some ideas around like breach and some great stuff. Uh, maybe it's relevant here too. But I'm very curious to hear what your thoughts are on the emerging presence of AI on culture and perhaps on uh, how we understand ourselves in the world. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because it was sort of, it was sort of ramping up as I was writing the bigger picture. So I, and I was really quite interested in it and using mid journey at the time as well. And and when the kind of, which even in the last sort of couple of years has just become so much more advanced even than it was when I was using it, but I was already kind of fascinated with just that process. There is a kind of, and, uh, the, the, uh, the host of the Emerald podcast, Josh Shry, makes this point in his episode about AI. It's like, there's a kind of magic feeling of, putting a prompt in and then getting an image out. There is a kind of sense of potential in it, right? And, and, and great danger as well. So I think the, I mean, look, there's a technical, there's a technological side of AI and the jobs it's already taking and, and that, that, that sort of huge shift in how we work. And that's, of course, you know, people have written reams of stuff about that already. I think I'm more interested in, the religious side and the spiritual side. What does it mean effectively in, in, a, in a culture that has tried its best to remove any sense of the transcendent or any place you can go for higher wisdom other than a human being or, or the edifice of science, right? The institutions to suddenly have what are effectively gods coming onto the scene that have this tremendous power and that we don't really understand and have all these mysterious aspects to them it is in a way it it could be the reemergence of a kind of religious um impulse even though it's coming from the least expected place it's coming from like the labs of MIT and elsewhere but but essentially what's happening is that something bigger than us is coming onto the scene, or at least that's our perception of it. That's at least in the cultural imagination, we're like, oh, fuck, <laughs> how do we control this thing bigger than us? Now, we haven't had that uh, for a couple hundred years since we you know, had our gods in you know, the god of the grove 
in our local town or the gods of the mountains and the sense of like, okay, there are, there are forces larger than us at work that impact our lives in ways we don't understand. That's really ancient. Like, in fact, most of human history, we've been like, yep, that's totally the case. You know, this thing happened because the, these gods and, you know, we're at the whim of that. And in a weird way, it's really probably good for us in the West to be like, to be humbled in that way. In another way, we're so incredibly immature. <laughs> like we're so immature in our ability to just like give up or give up a sense of agency or control or like you said before, be with uncertainty or have our ego, our collective egos, um, you know, challenge. We even struggle to see ourselves as sort of subservient or, or as a part of nature in an ecological niche. That's part of the problem. We're like, no, we're not in a niche. We are the fucking niche. We're going to do what we want. And it's like, ah, nah, man. <laughs> for long it can be the case for a while it's um it's a bit like uh jordan hall the thinker he had this metaphor of like um a marathon runner running on a broken ankle like just taking a sh shitload of speed and painkillers it's like for a while they're doing pretty well but like it's all an illusion right it doesn't really work and so i think in some way we're gonna have to come back to reconnecting to our niche in an ecosystem that's not at the top of the ecosystem and in fact there is no top or bottom it's just it's kind of more like a spiral probably um and so ai is this weird thing because on the one hand it it sort of could be used to deepen that pathology you know and it can also have the impact of sort of changing our perception of who we are um and yeah. So, so, so in, in that sense, uh, that's, I'm fascinated by it, you know, and, and also scared by it. You know? So, so I think that that's what I'm tracking right now. I'm waiting and I'm looking for the AI religion. That's what I'm looking for. I want to see who, where's it going to come from? What's it going to look like? Because I'm absolutely convinced it's going to happen. Uh, I don't know. It could be, it might not be the massive Scientology size, right? But I'm just, just sociologically, I'm just so interested in that. And that's, that's a big part of where I, um, I'd like to put some, you know, research hours into in the, in the coming years. Hmm. I mean, one, one question, you know, to, to ponder about, and isn't necessarily a question I'm asking now is the sort of line between, you know, cult and religion. It would seem to me that, uh, there is already a cult of AI. Um, it's, <laughs> and I don't mean the sort of like cult of AI in the sense of like the same people who were telling you how to invest in crypto or now teaching you how to make $10,000 a month, <laughs> you know, using mid journey and chat GPT, but there's already these sort of like growing cult insular type dynamics around, you know, developing this technology and incentives around what this technology is going to be for and perspectives on it's sort of like it's benevolence or it's malevolence right? Like these things are already kind of emerging. And I can see your reference to this like religiosity because it does have this magical God-like thing. And I don't mean that again, not, not technologically, but when I think about what could happen, you know, with AI, if it really, when it really goes full steam in our society, sort of has the, the sort of touch of it as though the hand of God came down and changed everything because it is such a massively disruptive technology. Um, and so wondering too about, I'm for myself wondering about, you know, incentive motives and how that actually translates into the impl the implement implementation of, uh, mm -hmm. of AI in our sort of society and in our world. I mean, like even some of the sort of like more shitty, like trivial ways in which it's starting to come out in a, in a, in a negative fashion are already kind of concerning. Like one thing I notice, especially on Facebook is I can't make a post without somebody being like, Oh yeah, I really enjoyed my time. Like I positively benefited my life with psilocybin and like somebody else would be like, really? Yeah. I've been actually wanting to explore it too. Do you know about microdosing? Yeah, I do. And somebody else would be like, Hey, I actually, I know a guy you can find him on Snapchat. And it's like yeah. every single one of these people are bots. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and that's minimal, right? Yeah. Like, uh, uh, the same thing, right? 
And this, this is, this is like the most trivial sort of possible damage. And I, cause if you extend that to how easy it is to manipulate certain subsets of the population to, you know, volunteering their personal information, like chances are none of those bots are trying to get you to someone who's going to sell you drugs. They just want your money. Um, like I've had, I had somebody contact me when I was being, you know, impersonated on the internet to sell drugs, literally contacted me like, what the hell, dude, I sent money and you never sent anything back. And I was like, oh, I'm no. really sorry that happened to you. Um, but chances are you're not getting drugs because <laughs> that was not me. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure they just took your money. Um, and this, and this, again, this is like so minimal. I listened to a discussion with Tristan Harris and, um, Trevor Noah on Trevor Noah's podcast. And Tristan was mm -hmm. talking about this idea of like, you take these AI models and you say, we're going to teach you about cars and you just give them cars, 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 all cars, only cars. And then at some point it goes cool. Now I know how to speak Mandarin. Right. And it's like, what happens when, you know, like all this effort is trying to be put in to make it so that I can't just like ask, you know, whatever it is, Claude, chat GPT, whatever the name of Facebook's one is to be like, cool. How do I make a dirty bomb? <laughs> how do I make these, how to make these things yeah. so that they can't tell me. And yet, but they know, even though like, what else do they know that the developers had no intention of them knowing. So there's like, and then how does that affect us when all of a sudden those things become possible um, or available to a public that has no idea how to use it responsibly? Yeah, I, I mean, th this is something I had a lot of fun writing about uh, in the book is that the similarities between well, the way the internet is evolving and shamanic realms that people have been visiting for tens of thousands of years because you know one possibility of the future of ai and our online life is, is something that um john rebakey points to he's like it's just a sea of bullshit it's just you don't know what's real anymore you don't know like already it's happening online it's like am i talking to a bot or a person is this the real james is this a, a bot james like you know it's it's basically uh it's not dissimilar to what shamans report of going into realms. I mean, so you've had psychedelic experience and an entity encounter where it's like, Hey, you know, let me download something into you. And you're like, well, I don't know, man. Like, who are you? <laughs> like, what's, what's going on here? And there's this great, um, there's this great, uh, story. Jeremy Narby, um, relates uh where uh, i forget who it was but some anthropologist was was in the jungle in in peru in like the 70s or 80s and he has this experience where these two with this like ayahuasca experience with in his visions these two huge dragons come and they're like bow before us we are the gods of the we are gods of the universe and he's like totally fucking terrified he's like oh my god what the fuck and then the next day he tells the shaman he's like i had this experience and he's like wait, 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 wait dragons he's like yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, they're the gods of the universe he's like yes he's like no nah, no nah, don't listen to them they're not the gods of the universe they're full shit <laughs> they always like, say that i've read this of, uh, that they want to they yeah. always say that yeah, yeah yeah and so i i just love that and it's just like that's that's like the dis so this is another skill or quality we need is the discernment to be and already i think generationally like i noticed that people in our generation have much more discernment than say like my my mom's generation much more easily scammed online you know obviously it's a generalization but i'd say i'd say millennials to boomers is a big difference and probably gen z are are, are even better than us right there's a, you have to be savvy and discerning to really navigate this space it's a bit like becomes a bit like snow crash you know to get back to sci-fi it's this kind of like wild fucking wild west online combination of the human body and 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 the the virtual which which we may, might be walking into and again i think psychedelics can prepare us for that if we use them in the right way because you know we can't press stop or let's say we could press stop but we're not going to press stop um on on the ai thing in some respect we can't and that's the so what's the, yeah. um, the multipolar trap uh you know one yes, of us can't exactly. press stop unless everyone else is going to press stop and there are definitely actors that are not going to press stop and so then what precisely so you so you mentioned you mentioned interacting with entities in the psychedelic realm um now i haven't asked you much about dmtx because you've <laughs> talked i think it's it's quite you know thoroughly in your book you talk about it on your various social media i've heard you talk about it in other interviews i wanted to get your perspective on, on other things um 
but I do want to ask you about it in a bit, which is that, or uh, ask you about it yeah. a little bit, um, which is, you know, you've been open that part of the, so for the people who weren't listening, best of my mm -hmm. understanding, you essentially had multiple sessions wherein you were put under intravenous DMT that was uh, a dose administration protocol and technology that made it so that you could be at a sustained level of like peak breakthrough experience for an extended period of time, um, far longer than you would have been if you say just smoked it or just injected it once. And exactly. it was ranging from 20 to 40 minutes. Is that right? It was, it was always the same. It was always the injection was going for 30 minutes and the experience would be for 40 minutes because obviously okay. when they stop injecting it, then it, then you're at the point of imagine you just smoked DMT and then your body's metabolizing it at that rate. So it was always exactly the same 30 minute injection. And then, but there was different strengths. So yeah, that's exactly right. What you just said, they were trying to get us in the dose finding trial into a, into a peak and plateau for as long as possible. So each dose was a bit different and, and at varying degrees of success at keeping that plateau. At the final dose, they really nailed it, I have to say. They did a great job at Imperial. Um, so yeah, that was the um, that was a wild trial to be part of. It's funny. Like they really nailed it. Like your first words on the way out, how are you doing, Alexander? Oh man, good. That was fucking sick. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um yeah. but uh <laughs> yeah. um so so you you were you've been very you know vocal about you know, the fact that experientially at least you interacted with others, others mm. that appear to be freestanding, separate, intelligent entities. You know, now, uh, what, like a year, a year out since that experiences or so, uh, maybe longer, I don't remember. Yeah. Do you feel as though looking back, that these were actual freestanding of your own mind, separate and intelligent entities. And side question, does it really matter if they were? Yeah. I mean, I think about this a fair amount and I, I would say I'm still agnostic because I think that's the only position I think is, is realistic to hold. And I was agnostic the entire way through as well. I was trying hold both these like is all me is it all a manifestation of mind and or is it these are independently arising intelligences or is it both at the same time where i'm at right now and where i've mainly come to is that it's both because i am much more a, a, a panpsychist you know i see that everything is um, you know, yeah, my position is that everything is conscious and that consciousness and matter are intertwined. And so in a sense, you know, I, I think those encounters are real in one sense. I also think they are really heavily influenced by our own perception, you know? So for example, me seeing a hyperdimensional chinchillas doesn't necessarily mean that hyperdimensional chinchillas in the form I saw them are floating around in the ether. But I do think the essence of them and the intelligence and the agency that they had, I, I lean towards the fact that th that is real and that there is that there is a way that we are tuning into, like Rick, Rick Strassman argued way, way back with DMT, the spirit molecule, you know, this idea of like, are we, are we just tuning into a different frequency? And that would tie in with a lot of um, indigenous cosmologies around the world and, and you know the Celtic cosmology is my lineage in the sense of half Irish at least one I one I'm very interested in of the world of the spirits and the world uh, and the dead and the world of of matter and day-to-day -day life being um sort of uh, inter intertwined so you know it's it's really it's really nuanced though right because you know I had these experiences for example where you know I had an experience where I encountered a very sensual, dangerous, like planet-sized, very feminine spider, like called the Spider Queen, right? And was sort of seduced by and had this whole process with it that then, you know, very clearly turned out to be uh, an internal process about my relationship with the people I love and intimacy and women and letting go and letting myself be loved. And so it was really profound. So I could look at that as like from a Jungian frame and be like, 
yeah, that was all just a manifestation of my unconscious to teach me a lesson. But what was weird about it is that it was that, but that also like the spider queen also seemed independently doing its own thing, regardless of whatever fucking lesson I learned from it or not. It's a very, very difficult to definitively say experientially um, what exactly was going on. So in one sense, I do though, if I have to like in my heart of hearts from the experiences I had and other experiences I've had, I would say I lean more towards that there are other non-human intelligences that are somewhere that we can access when we do things like take DMT, but also there's a lot of other practices that people use to that are non-drug related to, to have these encounters. Um, and some people have them spontaneously. So I think certainly the experience is undeniably real experience people are having, but also what are the ontology don't know but i lean very much towards there's something going on something really going on yeah hmm. so assuming they are they are air quotes mm -hmm. does that change your perspective on what solutions might be available to us in the midst of this crisis and all right here's a here's a little left curve a bit and with that consideration does that does that change your perspective on what so solutions are available to us if these others are do you see any connection between that and the somewhat recent, you know, congressional hearing on the on UAPs, on alien, whatever, um, sort of disclosure process? Yeah. Yes. I mean, okay. So it does actually change my perspective on like the meta crisis and how we might solve solve come to solutions because what it introduces is at least the possibility that our solutions are not going to come from other humans or or from from the systems we already have they're going to come from outside of us and that i think is something that is completely understandable to most other cultures you know at least you know throughout history this idea that if we're stuck we need to pray or we need to go into nature and speak to the spirits other spirits and get some other, like we would with human beings be like, okay, I'm stuck in this problem. I can talk to a few friends and get a few different perspectives. You know, this person is really kind of cynical, but they, they don't, there's no bullshit. This person's really compassionate. You know, they're going to give me a different perspective. All the different gods of the natural world and different traditions have those qualities. It's like, okay, I'm going to talk to the trickster because, you know, can't fully trust them, but eh, they're, they're pretty crafty. They might have a crafty solution to this. So it absolutely does change it. Um, and I think that's something in the missing, um, from, from what I've said so far is that when we're looking at something like the medic price, and this is a talk about, right? Because it can be so bullshit. But when we're talking about how are we going to get out of the mess we're in as human beings, what we often leave out in our culture is, well, maybe the answers isn't going to come from other human, from human beings. Maybe there are other forces at work in the universe. And I think there are. The issue is that there is like a million and one people doing like uh, spirit readings and selling tarot cards who are just totally full of shit and grifters and you can't, it's so difficult. And then others presumably who aren't, right? Right. So and there's also those the two difference? dragons that always seem to claim that they're the creators of the universe, right? <laughs> yeah, no, <don't>, <laughs> yeah. Who exactly. do you trust on the other side <laughs> even? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, so how do you actually do that? Um, and I have no idea, but so I think it's a kind of cool problem to have though, if you know, like, and, and so it takes me into like territory that for me is sort of uncomfortably woo or can go uncomfortably woo, but I think it's worth exploring in a sort of grounded way if we can. Um, what was the second part of the question? I got distracted by the dragons. <laughs> uh, that's okay. Um, uh, it wasn't relevant. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it <laughs> was how how the sort of like i haven't followed it much but i did watch the congressional hearing on uaps which i believe is unidentified aerial yes. phenomenon which is the government's new word for ufos and disclosure there and even in the congressional hearing the guy there said something to the effect of like well they might not be extraterrestrial they might be extra dimensional so with that kind of coming out and the sort of uh the uncertainty of whether or not any of that can be believed and whether or not what it's telling us is actually what's what we get from those things is what the government wants us to believe or if it's the opposite that they want us to believe or whatever it might be that all aside or maybe included do you feel like that connects with this sort of question you have now around the sort of change in how we find these solutions yeah, I, I think it connects. I have a sense that it connects somewhere, but I couldn't, I, I don't know where, right? So 
there's this kind of, uh, yeah, this idea of, or this split between the nuts and bolts spacecraft of hypothesis, like there's physical spacecraft. And that's also in the congressional hearings. You know, you have people saying like, yeah, we have pieces of craft. And I'm like, that's confusing to me. And the footage, if, if it, unless it's like a massive ops, which it could also be. And I'm very, I go towards wait, wait, that. Pause, can you repeat well. the last 30 seconds? Um, you, you cut out quite a bit. So there's the nuts and bolts spacecraft, which you have a hard time believing. And yeah. Yeah. So there's the nuts and bolts spacecraft, which, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know really, but I think the other side of it is the idea that yes, they are hyperdimensional, they're transdimensional and in some, but what's difficult about that is why there's two questions I have. Why do we have this government supplied footage of say, you know, from the Navy and, and these sort of seemingly credible people from the Navy talking about these, uh, sort of real measurable experiences with these craft. And we have then like billions of people with smartphones and we don't have a single convincing piece of footage from there. Right. So that's always very confusing to me. And then also the, the sense that, um, the, yeah, I mean, it's interesting that the, the way that they fly, you know, from what I've looked at seems to be tra like basically defy the laws of physics, which is kind of interesting as well. So these things do seem interrelated and the, the experience of human beings having encounters with non-human entities is, uh, certainly it's in the same realm, right. As, as the DMT space, of course, Graham Hancock argued in, in supernatural that these are the same phenomena, you know, this this sense of, um, these alien encounter phenomena are, you know, really related to the DMT experience, which I think there's, you know, there's, I think there's a solid argument in that. And, you know, um, uh, you know, David Pascal, uh, Michael did a paper where they looked at DMT experience and they were comparing it to the near death experience. And in that paper, they're like, actually it's more like alien encounters. And I think so too, because I never hear people talking about near death experiences where like an insectoid alien came and like anally probed them in their near death experience. And there it's always like, you no, know, like family. And, and there's this kind of this white light and this sense of completion and okayness. I'm like, I've never had that kind of experience on DMT. I've never had anything close to that kind of experience on DMT. It's close to like, ketamine, honestly. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think there's, that, that's that's interesting that it, it gets more to the alien encounter experience. So, you know, do we, are we psychically projecting the need for non-human intervention into culture? You know, that's also a possibility. And, and maybe we are able to, to manifest these kind of... Um, seeming experiences of the other through that, you know, to take a slightly more Jungian lens. I don't know really, but, but I do question why we don't have more footage, why we don't have more solid footage, um, of, of craft that that's like super convincing and that the sources that we do have are all from, from the military. You know, it's, I mean, it's, I mean, it's a conundrum in, in fair, in fair rebuttal there, the, yeah. the recording capacities of the Navy of the military of the Air Force, arguably, yeah. you know, much higher uh, granularity, you could say, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. than the average person's smartphone, and simultaneously, much more seemingly trustability. Because my sense is there's actually millions of videos on the internet. It's just we don't rec like if you've ever been on the subreddit That's of like our weird. There's some fucking crazy stuff that people are posting. <laughs> and I'll tell you, my response is honestly, most of the time, like, weird, no idea, you know, scroll <laughs> on. So it's possible that yeah. that is there too. Um, culturally, though, maybe you haven't had time to formulate a full th thought on this, and that's fair. So edge of your thinking, or maybe you decline to respond. Do you have a, any concerns or, or, or thoughts on what the cultural impact might be. I mean, so far the cultural impact seemed to be like it was on the news for like a couple of days. And then outside of the people who already gave a shit, nobody gave a shit. But do you have a sense or any concerns around what might be the cultural impact on the sort of meta crisis if it became increasingly more presented in the mainstream? I don't know how real or proven it is, but more presented that these phenomenon are representing encounters with non-human agents. Yeah. I mean, as a, to take it as a thought experiment, like I think, I think it could go a bunch of different ways in one sense. 
what we lack is a coherent narrative about what it is to be human that we can all globally agree on. I mean, probably we've always lacked that to some degree, but certainly let's just take the West. We lack a sense, consumer, late stage capitalism and consumer culture does not give us a, a why to do anything or even some, even kind of any coherence about why we're doing anything that we're doing. So a, a reliable encounter with the other, I think would like with first contact you know where it happens during like world war three right or the aftermath of world war three like it would it could have the potential of bringing us together because we would then i start identifying as um a species rather than as sort of the, the narcissism of small differences yeah that i could see that happening i could also see this really cynical version of it where just no one fucking gives a shit <laughs> people are like you know like some people give a shit like you said about what's happening now with the ufo phenomena um and there's a sense of like no i mean to be fair i, I think probably if it was really convincing and it was like it, what's lacking is embodiment right what's lacking is as human beings we understand the world through our bodies right and we need to be able to see and touch these phenomena in some way you know and maybe they're not like that. Maybe they are hyperdimensional. So maybe it's never that experience, but there's at least an encounter. Like if you had an abduction experience, that changes people quite significantly. It's also also very distressing for people, partly probably because they're coming back into a world where no one believes them. But I think it would have to be a lived experience of it. I think we can't have it mediated through sort of news media because we don't really we're so oversaturated and we don't necessarily trust what we're seeing anyway at, or like we have other concerns, you know? So I think it would need to be, if it was that kind of embodied, like real experience or that felt, you know, an experience after people feels realer than real, like smoking DMT does, um, that I could see having some probably quite chaotic changes, um, that could lead to better solution for the crisis. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, one thing I was thinking about was, you know, if we don't already, if if the news or the content doesn't already align with a, a emotionally embodied inclination towards or against a thing, then we're unlikely to take it very seriously. Like, there's a lot of people that yeah. are getting all their information entirely on the internet and in like very compromised, you know, very compromised places, and yet they feel absolutely certain about what they're reading. And I've heard, I think it was. Um, um, Eric Davis. And I've also heard Naomi Klein speak to this, but something around like it, it, it touches some sort of emotional truth for them. And so because of that, the sort of like the, the literal truth of the thing becomes sort of fastened to their sense that it feels true. It feels coherent with their own disposition. Like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm feeling afraid of larger forces and being violated. And so when someone tells me larger forces are violating you through X, Y, Z, regardless of how outlandish it might seem to your sort of general frame of cognitive reference, it's going to feel extra true and it's going to feel coherent and appeasing to that feeling because it's verifying that feeling. And so, okay, now I have congruence between what I quote, know about what's happening and what I feel inside. And so that makes it true. And if that isn't happening, it's just like, whatever, I don't care. Or the opposite of like, no, I reject that completely. So I assume that UAPs and whatever's going to come from this. I think it's UAPs. Maybe it's UAEs. Um, no, it is. Yeah. UAPs, that's right. um, it's probably going to fall in a similar, in a similar camp, um, assuming anything comes of it at all uh, before we are overtaken by AI or whatever's coming next <laughs> or climate change. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. let's, let's get to the final question. Um, this one's kind of like, I'm, I'm asking you to, I'm asking you to like dig in a little bit and I, mm -hmm. I expect you to hold up your own boundaries around what level of vulnerability you want to offer to this question. Um, what keeps you up at night? You know, you're sense making all of these things, you're you're wondering about these different cultural events. You know, what is happening in the world right now that you are seeing unfolding unfolding or has the potential to unfold that has you reaching the deepest into your sense making toolkit, not to be taken totally out of your window of tolerance. Yeah. So, you know, it's when I think about this, I don't think about cataclysm. Like, I don't think about like, like, you know, 
everything suddenly crumbling or the kind of like the fantasies of like the 90s movies that we had of like, you know, Day After Tomorrow or Deep Impact or Armageddon, where it's just like big, dramatic kind of like boom apocalypse. I, I worry much more about this sort of slow decline into a darker time that we see, you know, I mean, I think the conflict in Gaza is sort of an indicator of that in some ways, right? It's very, very distressing and, and a sense of like that the thin veneer of civilization is not as strong as we think, you know, like that, you know, it's kind of um, Hobbesian philosophically. It's like that once you take away the, the civilizational agreement, the social contract, the kind of brutality that's present in human beings will come out. I don't think we're only brutal. I think, I think we're very complex, multifaceted, but I think there's this sense of, yeah, we've sort of, humanism sort of gets, doesn't really know how to deal with the problem of evil very well. Right. And so we don't really have a kind of framework for that. And so when we see it, it's totally shocking, even though it's also part of the human experience. So I worry about the, the kind of thing that, um, yeah, actually that like, uh, Lynch is writing about in the prophet song that, that Booker winning, uh, book where about like this, it's like about this like slow ascent of authoritarianism. And it's, you know, I mean, like it's you know, arguably happening in America right now as we speak, you know? So, um, that's what I worry about more. And it's the, you know, I don't know if you've seen the, the movie children of men. Have oh, you seen that? Be- beautiful. Uh, yeah. Let me tell you a little side story about that after. Uh, yeah. right. So, you know, that for me is the most distressingly realistic of a kind of future thing about children right but because of the way the world looks everything is kind of the way it looks now but it's more authoritarian it's more dangerous uh, there's there's mass immigration that every developed country is dealing with in variously uh, more or less compassionate ways there's there's climate change um affecting the countries that are least equipped to affect to kind of actually do anything about it and there's just this the sense of a shitter world. It's kind of like a, a dark ages, you know, in a sense. That for me um, is distressing because it feels real. It feels like a realistic. I don't think it's necessarily what's going to happen, but it's the thing. It's the thing I I would like to do my best to contribute towards avoiding um, is that. And so that partly means like, you know, that's why the how and the why become so important. It's like developing new ways of what it is to be a human being and what we truly value and then from that developing new systems because our systems will lead us there or they'll lead us to this kind of like china style authoritarianism where with so you know sort of digitally mediated social monitoring systems and social credit scores and you know single party rule like that's what i would that that terrifies me because that's no you know that goes against all my values yeah and it's and it seems very plausible that we could we could slide into that yeah. very easily from where we are now, given uh, g- given given the conditions of society as it stands. Um, yeah, I, I I share actually similar fears um, uh, strongly, actually, um, and not that poignant, and you know. Uh, strong gravity, difficult things need to be responded to with some sort of lighthearted response. They don't, mm-hmm. period. And <laughs> this little story about children of men. Um, I went to, <laughs> fuck me, uh, I went to uh, Glastonbury Festival, which is a festival in the UK, which is mm-hmm. huge. And it was raining a lot and I didn't have the right size boots and everything was really far away. And I was there. I didn't pay for a ticket. I got in on this random opportunity. And at some point I was like, I hate this festival. I don't want to be here. And I was sharing a tent with someone. It was like a two room <laughs> tent, you know, or it's like two tents that are sort of connected. And I decided for this particular night, I'm not going out. I'm just like sitting there and going to be on my laptop watching Children of Men. And there's a scene in Children of Men near the end, which I won't say, but it's a particularly evocative scene. And it goes on for several minutes. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure I just cried nonstop through that entire scene um, with my headphones on. And I don't know, I I should hope that they weren't in the other tent because they certainly didn't come (laughs) in and check on me. 
Um, <laughs> but, uh, but if they were, um, it would, I imagine it would be quite interesting to just like be sitting there doing their lines or whatever the hell they were doing. And just like the person in the other 10 who they didn't know is just like crying alone. <laughs> Little do they know <laughs> it's just such a beautiful movie. Um, beautiful and it dark. Is. Yeah. 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 I love okay. That. I love that. Yeah. All right. So that little fun aside, hopefully didn't detract from the poignancy of what you're saying. And uh, this is conclusion here. Um, Alexander, great to talk with you. I have been really enjoying your work since I discovered it through Rebel Wisdom and ongoingly as you've set off on your book and your Substack, And uh, I appreciate you coming again on the show. Um, where can people learn more about your stuff? So for example, what is Substack? How do they get to Substack, yours? And uh, a little bit more about where they could buy your book if they're interested. Yeah, thanks. And thanks for thanks for the conversation, man. It's really um, always a pleasure and, and just so deep and rich. So yeah, I really appreciate you having me on. Um, so Substack is effectively a newsletter and sort of like a blogging platform, what would have been called a blogging platform before. That's where I put out, you know, um, my articles uh, so they can find that on, yeah, people can go to biner, B-E-I-N-E-R dot substack dot com. Um, the sub stack is called the bigger picture and that's also the title of my book, uh, the bigger picture and that my book can be found on actually if people go to my website, alexanderbiner.com, you can find links to all the stuff. Um, but you can find the book in, you know, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, um, uh, Waterstones in the UK and, uh, and apparently some independent bookstores, but, uh, I have friends occasionally send me a picture of, uh, some random bookstore in like Catskill book which always is like one of my favorites to receive it's really kind of surreal but yeah so th that's probably the best thing is it's on my website yeah. and it's an audio book as well is that right so, yes that's absolutely true yeah so it's on audible as well yeah narrated by uh, me yeah excellent um okay with that alexander thanks so much for coming again on to adventures through the mind and uh take care you too james thank you so much and cut okay that was this episode of the podcast. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Alexander Biner. Please do follow up with checking out his book, The Bigger Picture. I'm going to show you here on the screen on YouTube if you're watching. Uh, but if you're just listening to it, uh, it's a nice cover. Simple, clear, psychedelic, but not you know in your face psychedelic. Plus, it's a great book. I think that's really what matters. As much as we say, don't judge a book by its cover, we always do. Uh, and I think the cover does suggest that this is a pretty good book. But that's just uh, my opinion. I hope that yours is at least similar. Uh, links to find his book and all of that are in the show notes of this episode at jameswbjesso.com, or you could just search The Bigger Picture. If you want to check out his Substack, I love his writing a lot. It was such an honor to have him on the show for a second time. Uh, links to that are also available where you can look up the bigger picture Substack on Google or your preferred search engine. And finally, before we close out, again, this show and my ability to do the larger body of work that supports it, which presently also includes uh, writing a book, that is something that I get to do as my full-time job because of the generosity and caring of people who see value in the work that I'm doing and want to contribute to it in a financial way, want to be a part of the the digital and physical community of people that support my work. And I appreciate that quite a lot. And if you would like to become a person involved in that community, you can do so by one-time donation via PayPal or by signing up for my Patreon. Patreon is a financial based sort of membership type platform. You've probably already heard of it, but you can also sign up as a free member if you'd like to just follow what I do without having to rely on the algorithms to dice roll it into your reality, your digital reality. I guess that's it. Uh, thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Adventures Through the Mind all the way to the end, and I will see you on the next one. Take care.